All right, guys, welcome back to the next part of this video on this new process 246 transfer case. Today, we're going to be putting it all back together, doing a full remanufacture rather than just a rebuild. That means we're going to be replacing all the gaskets, all the seals, all the bearings, and any part that has friction or wear, such as the clutch pack. We're going to be using the service information from GM at www.acdelcotds.com. You can get a weekend subscription to that. And in this assemble section, they're going to talk about a number of tools. You do not need all of them. Some of them are nice to have. Some of them are must have. Some of them we can just translate into more generic tools. And I'll point all that out as we go. So let's get started. So the first thing they had talked about um, in the assembly manual, they talk about studs on the front half of the case, right? We did not remove our studs, so we do not have that to do. If you did, that's an item that you can go take care of. The next thing they talk about is getting it mounted into a bench top uh, fixture so that you can rotate it and work on it. And again, that's a nice to have item that we're not gonna do. The coverage on this video will be the, the new Venture Gear. Remember, new process, changed this name a couple of times. It started off as new process between GM and Chrysler. It became new Venture Gear, and then later on became something else. Um, it's going to cover the 236 used in the T pickups and SUVs, which have preload clutches, and then all three flavors of the 246 used in the K pickups and utilities, both the early non-preload clutches as well as the newer style with a preload clutch. So all of those will be covered in this video. First up is going to be... Um, the input bearing. Now notice here that they've got a couple of notes here I'll call out. So one of the other things we'll be doing, more than just a rebuild, all new retaining rings. So we won't be reusing any of the snap rings or the clips or anything like that. Those will all be replaced as well. So we're going to go ahead, get this guy opened up. And actually before we start this first page of the assembly manual, if you guys watched my disassembly uh, video, you know that one of the things we did was we took this off, which was the annulus gear ring. So the annulus gear is pressed into the front half of the case and is not serviced separately on the 246. If there's a problem with this gear, you have to replace the entire case. But we took off the, the ring here, the retaining ring, just because we wanted to have an easier job cleaning. So at this point, we're going to replace that, and that is serviced by GM, and that is going to be replaced by a 140 Three seven nine five three part. That's like opening the packages like this rather than trying to rip them open because we don't want to bend anything. So we're just going to confirm this is our same thickness ring, same shape on the end. And this ring here has got some more life to it, so it's more out, which is exactly why you want to replace these rings, right? A guy like this, we can just get him started by hand. And then for the last little bit, we'll get a little pry tool Pop him in the last little bit. Sorry, I might block your view a little bit here. All right, so I'm just grabbing it up on the little ear until I can get it into place and snap it in. Boom. Now we can move on to that input bearing. So our input bearing, we've got two of these bearings that we're going to use that are the same part number. 890-59659, and those are going to correspond to both of these rear bearings. And um, if we take a look over here at the parts explosion, we're working on front case half. So we're working on front case half part 9, and it's retaining ring 10, and front case half 40, and it's retaining ring 41. Those are the two pieces that we're doing, and specifically we're doing 40 and 41 right now. And so what I did, if you remember from the disassembly video, we did a couple of things. We marked these with that 
number that they came out of the diagram and then we also marked them yellow if they faced to the rear and blue if they faced to the front and you'll see that all through the video and that's important because here you can see the balls and here you can see the retaining cage and this goes in a certain way and then the rings we have 10 and 41 and the ring corresponds to part 12547465 so we're going to go ahead and drop this first guy in which just to be consistent with that one is number 40 a bag in a bag All right so just like we looked at our old one we're going to have the balls face up even though this one doesn't have that kind of design so in fact in this one it could go either way when it can go either way find any numbering that's on it and have the numbering face up that's going to sit right in like that and we're going to have to get something to tap it in Nothing heavy, just a small rubber mallet will be fine just to get it in there so that we can set the snap ring. And now we're going to put our snap ring in just like we did the larger one. Now this guy I can kind of grab a little bit easier, pull one of these out. And we're going to install it just like we did the bigger one on the annulus gear up above. What's important on these though is you notice there's an opening right here. You never want to get the opening of the ring around that. You want to get it away from there. I know to a certain extent guys I'm going to block your view but unavoidable. All right now that guy's in there. Okay, let's keep going. Alright guys, next up is the front output shaft bearing. So that's going to be front case half part 9 in our parts explosion. Alright, so 9 and retaining ring 10. So we kept our original parts just to compare. We're going to be replacing that again with an 890-59659 GM bearing. And again, the replacement bearings do not have a cage on the side, so we're just going to take the writing and face them up. Just like last time, we're going to take a rubber mallet, tap them into position. And then we're going to grab our ring, which again is a 12547465. And again, just like on the other side, wherever you have an open area, you want to try and stay away. Um, excuse me, an open area like this, you want to stay, stay away from having the opening of the ring in that area. So we're just going to wedge him in here. Had to push him in just a little bit more. Get him started. Grab a tool to help out. Snap him in. And again, you want to go all the way around and make sure that this guy is fully seated. Fully seated. All right, let's go on. All right, so with, with the front output shaft bearing, and again, they mentioned the cage side faces to the front of the case. The replacement bearing does not use a cage. So we're just going to have the writing face up give us the same effect. Um, install the front, how, front output shaft bearing retaining ring and now they want us to move on to this bearing. So here they have a special tool, the J36370. Now I have this tool and they mention on the instructions here that you want to use the double shoulder side of this tool. 
So what they're referring to is there's a side of this tool that doesn't have a, sh a double shoulder like this, and there's a side that has a double shoulder. And then they have it installing into the J8092. I've got an equivalent of that. It's not an actual 8092, but it's the same kind of a thing. And you could drive it in like that. I'm actually going to use, though, the um, press for this rather than hammering it. But essentially what they're talking about doing here is they've, they've switched on the switch to the rear case half on us instead of staying with the front case half they've switched to the rear case half and they're talking about this bearing that goes right in here and so when we took that off we marked it on our parts diagram as rear case half part 11 and that's going to get be replaced by a GM 12547173 bearing it sits in a box it sits in like this and the installation on that, we'll take over to the press and show you. And I'll also show you um, an alternative setup with a standard bearing uh, driver set if you don't have this tool. And let's see, the lettering on the bearing faces towards the tool. So what they're saying on something like that is if we look at our original, you can see here, you know, I marked it in blue because this side faces the front. You can see there's writing on this side. And so that was the side that they're saying will face this tool, All right? So let's go to the press and get this one in. All right, guys, we've got this in the press. Unwrapping the bearing. Remember the manual mentioned having the stamped in writing facing up. So you can see the writing's only on one side. Right, here's our double shouldered version of this tool, like so. And then we're going to set it in, and then I'll show you um, an alternative approach. And I've got the case sitting on a block of wood just to take some of the stress off of the magnesium. And so we do this tool this, uh, until this tool bottoms out on the top of the case, in which case we are done. And so what have we done here? And there's our block of wood. And there's our bearing installed. So this tool with this double shoulder is sitting inside and then pushes down on the second shoulder to get this indent into the case for the bearing and then the outer piece stops against the top of the case. Now you could take a standard driver with a 50 millimeter and a 60. That corresponds to the inside and outside of this tool. So this is 50 and this is 60. What we don't have is this little step because we can only assemble things like this. And so what you would have to do if you only if you only have this type of tool is you'd have to get it in partway with that and then you'd have to have another piece that you push in this little bit. So I'm going to go show you how much of an indent this is so you can do it that way and also give you the size. All right guys, so I told you I'd give you the measurements on this, right? So the outside of this tool 49.9 49.96, right? It's got some wear. That's 50, 50 millimeters. The main barrel of the tool, 60 millimeters. The step that we were talking about earlier, around 57 millimeters. Right? So what you can do is you can come over to your set and grab a 57. You can use that to push this guy in. Yeah, I think that's going to be fine. You could use that to push this guy in the additional distance, right? Let's try a 58 just in case. Actually, you know what? I would say I would say 58. I would say a 58. A 58 would be what you could use if you didn't have this special tool to get that indentation. So you'd put this back together again. 
with this guy, a 58 and a 50, you'd be able to push him in that distance. And that distance is this indentation that this lip on the special tool does. That amount is about 2.3 millimeters, right? That's how far it's sitting in to the case. Taking a couple of different measurements here, yeah, but 2.3. So that hopefully will help you get that bearing installed. All right, let's keep going. All right, so we got past this, and we got the front output shaft bearing installed. Now this next step, you're going to have to have the special tool. And the reason is that this needle bearing, you have to have something that's long enough to keep it in place. And I don't think the, the universal sets go in long enough. I'll measure this for you, and you can give it a shot but um, I'm going to be using this. And this you can't get into the uh, press because it's an awkward shape. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be coming over to this side of the case and we're going to be installing the needle bearing that goes in here. And our old one is right here. Right, so there's some writing on this bearing. It's hard to make out. I'll try to make it out later and put it at the bottom of the uh, description because the GM part, while I have it, is discontinued, so it's kind of hard to track down. But it's a 1254-7464. Anytime you happen to see me have a little red mark on this white um, numbering to the parts explosion, that means it's a discontinued GM part. But that's our guy. And basically, the way this guy goes, you look inside, there's lots of little needle bearings in here packed in grease from the factory. And this tool's job is to hold all those in while you install it. Right? To keep them from falling out. So we're going to end up just driving that in with a brass hammer. Let's see if they mention anything else specific about that. Nope. And the next thing I'm going to have us do they're going to have us install the actuator control lever. So we have our original one that we cleaned up. So that's our original one we just cleaned up. They're just going through now showing you that there's some differences between the years. The non-preload clutch uses a different lever than the preload clutch. The correct lever must be used to prevent drivability concerns. The uh, Number two actuator lever for the non-preload clutch does not have any holes, so we have the correct one because we have this is an older 1999 246 that has a non-preload clutch. The newer ones have those two holes that you see in the picture. Other than that, they're the same. They would want us to lubricate the control actuator lever shaft and bearing, so the bearing is pre-lubricated if it's brand new from GM. If yours is an aftermarket one, don't forget to give it some pre-lubrication. We're then going to install this shaft and we're going to install a new retaining ring. I want you to mention over here that every time you put a retaining ring on the service manual, GM wants it to be new so that it holds on. Ensure that retaining ring is fully seated and then we're ready for something else. Let's get all these pieces on. All right, guys, so we're about to install this control actuator lever shaft bearing. This is an example where sometimes you have to have multiple sources of information. So service information from GM is supposed to be the most accurate but all it says is install the bearing. It doesn't take note of the fact that this bearing has writing on one side and on the side that does not have writing there's a, there's a seal. You see that black seal in there. And so what we want to know is well which side faces out. So we're going to go refer back to the unit repair manual which is usually obsolete but it does have some extra data that's important for this. So same tool 42737 they, may, they mention ensure that the bearing seal is positioned outward and the lettering on the bearing is positioned inward. That's the tip we needed to know. I'm not sure why it got dropped when they did the updated manual, but now we know that the seal faces outward and the writing faces inward. And by the way, um, the, 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 the uh, bearing writing on this guy is a F, well, I've got to pull it close to my face here, it's an F68828. F68828 is the bearing. All right, so we're just going to come over here. We're going to position that guy right there. Just going to push him in with our finger for a moment. 
we're going to grab our special tool and we are going to grab a brass hammer and we're going to tap that guy in using the special tool. You could also use a brass drift. What we're looking for is that we've got this in all the way. You can see there's a little tiny gap right there. Just going to get the tool to seat on the case to close that up. Tool seated on the case and now we can see the gap is closed up, right? So we're done. All right, guys, let's take a look at the measurements on this J42737. So the outside, 18.8 millimeters. And the part that rests against the case, almost 51 millimeters. The whole enchilada, about 28 millimeters long. So hopefully that'll help you match up an alternative driver tool. All right, let's put this guy over here. Let's take our lever. Let's position him in. I'm just twisting him around to get the grease nice and rotated around here. That was, you can see, so I'm gonna make sure that grease is all the way around on those needle bearings. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna install the retaining ring right here. So we're going to get our snap ring pliers and that retaining ring is going to be a GM1566234. Little tiny guy. Little tiny guy that is capable of flight. So you're definitely going to want to have eye protection. All right. Now we just want to get him on the shaft first. I might have to get something propped up behind here to keep this lever in position or have a helper hold it until I can get this guy on there. Yeah, let me do that. Let me get something to prop that open. All right. Now we can get this guy on because he's going to stay in position. Not on yet. And I'm going super gentle with this little guy because he's small and he's more likely to deform. All right. And what we want to see is we want to see that he is in this groove right here, right? So that shows he's going to be staying on. And what I use to prop this up is I just grabbed a piece of wood, put a piece of plastic on it so we don't get any wood shavings on here, just so we can push against this and do the job one manned. All right, let's go to the next step. All right, so now we're moving on to the output shaft. If it's a brand new shaft or for some reason you removed the cup plug, now you need to put it back in with a driver. In our case, we've got our cleaned up and restored original here. And the cup plug is still in there. We never took it out. If you took off the tone wheel for the speed sensor, you need to put that back on. They have a special tool called a J22873, but really 
anything that you can get over this to cone down and push against this tone ring will be fine inside of a press. At this point, we can take this guy and we can install him right in here. And it's just trying to make sure he is fully seated. And he is fully seated. All right, for the 236, same deal. You install it the same way. For the 246 now, we can install the front output shaft retaining ring. So let's move on to that. All right, that's going to be front case half part number 30. And that's going to be replaced by a GM682653. All right, same thickness ring. Let's just go ahead and get that guy on here. Got to get him open enough to get him around this groove. So I didn't notice that. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, got him in there. And again, just like with all the other ones, it's super important to make sure that these guys are fully seated. And the way you can do that is just watching how much space you have on the outside of this as you turn it around. And we can be satisfied that he is fully in place. All right, next step. Wind's blowing our pages. Where were we? All right, we just inf just got this uh, input shaft retaining ring. Same deal with the 236 if you're working on that. All right, so now we're moving on to the planetary assembly. So let's get those parts out and get ready to go with that. Um, there's a little bit of a note here that says on the 246, it can either have a four pinion or six pinion gear planetary carrier assembly. The four is used with transmission RPO M30 and the splines for the gear are 27 teeth. The six pinion is used with RPO MT1 and MN8. This, this one came off an MT1 4L80E and it's going to have input gear splines with 32 teeth. The, uh, the new process 236 transfer case uses a three pinion planetary carrier. The procedure is the same for all three. All right, so they're going to want us to lubricate the thrust washer with J36850. All J36850 is is transgel red. It's not even a tool. It's it's a it's a chemical. So transgel red is what GM means when they say JD J36850. They want us to install the shaft thrust washer, which is what they're showing here. Align the tabs with the slots in the planetary carrier. It looks like the next step is going to be installing this pocket bearing. Yes. They're going to want you to use a J45383. I do not have a J45383 to show you. I'm going to be doing that one by eye from pictures from the original. But basically what we're going to be doing here is taking this piece, which is uh, internal transfer case part 36 from the diagram. And we're going to be installing the pilot bearing. This picture here. And you're installing that there. So let's go ahead and get that bearing installed. Then we'll come back and do the thrust washer. All right, guys. So inside of our internal transfer case parts explosion, ITC 36, which is this guy. ITC 35, which is this guy. It's this pocket bearing. It's what they're wanting us to install here this guy right here. And this is going to be replaced by a discontinued part again, GM123540 would be the replacement bearing. In the back of this guy it says Torrington and the number on it is DB 
looks like five nine eight five six if that's not right I'll roll something at the bottom so that's the original and our replacement from GM right identical this one has a little bit of a different number on it it's INA and it says FC 66561 so those are your actual bearing supplier numbers and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking this over to the press and pressing this guy in right there we're going to get a, an adapter that'll let us do that all right guys got our bearing pocket bearing sitting inside here what we're going to be using is a 28 on the inside and a 38 on top And again, we got this sitting on some wood so it doesn't get damaged because there's not a lot of uh, pressure needed to seat this guy. If we go sit inside there, you know, we can see she's going in. And then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be periodically checking to see how far. We got it in. All right, so we're going to keep going in until we get it past the bevel. And since we don't have the tool, we're going to have to go slow because we don't want to get it in the wrong spot. necessarily going to bore you guys with this whole trial and error process but you'll get the idea here right we're just going to go in a little bit each time I think on this next one you'll be able to see the bevel I'm talking about let's see Yeah, so you guys can see the bevel I'm talking about. So we just got just a hair more. So we're going to get that extra hair, and I'll show you the final product. All right, guys, this is where I ended up with the seating of this pocket bearing. If we zoom in super close, we can see I've got it just right at the edge of the witness mark for the previous bearing, which is about as accurate as we're going to be able to get without having the special tool. Now, if you go too far, you can, you know, go on the other side with a brass drift and tappy tap it out a little bit. You know, hopefully you won't do that because you want to have that guy seated only one way. So we're done with this part. We're ready to install it. So now we're going to continue on with what the service manual was telling us to do. They wanted us to start with the planetary carrier, which is internal transfer case part 39. Here's our original, all cleaned and restored and ready to go. You know, when you go through the inspection of something like this, you want to make sure that there are no chips or cracks on any of these teeth. That's mostly the only thing you need to worry about for this part. All right, so they want us to install the um, input shaft thrust washer. So the input shaft thrust washer was internal transfer case part number 34, and that gets replaced with a GM1554790. This is definitely one of those kind of parts that you don't want to get bent and make wavy. Right, so it looks like that. There's ridges that face down on one side. And in between there are ridges that face down in between those, right? So there's dimples all the way around it. We put a blue mark where we had these four dimples and these three so we're going to put it back in the same way so they want us to lube it up with trans gel just so we're going to do that first and then we're going to put this guy in just like that okay 
Next, they want us to take this assembly that we put together and drop it inside. Next, they want us to put the um, input shaft thrust bearing. So that's the next guy we need to put on. And that would be internal transfer case part 37, and that gets replaced by a GM 12470959. Again, this is another one that's very thin metal. And you do not want to bend it. I want to be generous with the trans lube, trans gel rather. Now our original one faced up with the cutouts in this direction. Probably doesn't matter, but we'll make sure we put it back the same way. And then next they want us to put the uh, carrier lock plate on and they say to have, so we have our original cleaned and restored, so that's internal transfer case part 38. Install that with the letter facing up. They get some green paint on that facing up. And then they want us to lock it in with a snap ring. So that should be, let's see. I believe that's the small plate. It might be the big one, let me see. Yeah, it's this big guy here. So that's gonna be a 155-47397. So let me move some stuff out of the way so we can get that in. Usually when you hear it pop like that, you're done, but just double check to make sure everything's seated. All right, next step. Now we're gonna install the planetary gear into the front half of the case, and we're gonna secure it with another retaining ring as it protrudes out the back. All right, now we're gonna take this unit assembly and install it into here and through the annulus gear. in there. Got to get it to seat on that bearing. To take our rubber mallet. See if we can coax it along. trying to get it through that bearing that we have down there. So I think what I'm going to do is give a little bit of lubrication. Where it sits on the bearing. To help us get past that. See if we can get past this bearing piece.
You don't want to force it, so you definitely want to just stick with something like a rubber mallet. You might have to work on it a little bit because all the parts that are new now are going to have much more tight tolerance than the old parts we took out. She is going in little bit by little bit. There we go. Now you can tell when you're done because you can see that the pinion teeth on the carrier will be flush and level with the annulus gear. So now she should stay in enough for us to flip her around and get the retaining ring on. So the retaining ring for this one was a front case half 34 part, which is another one of these GM 682 653 rings. using a brass punch here to help nudge her into position. There we go. It's always like to make sure. And then again, like usual, you can tell, you can look all the way around the circumference and make sure that the space that you're seeing between the ring and the bearing is the same, and that'll tell you that everything is seated. All right, this sub-assembly is done. Let's move on to the next. All right, next step is to install new short shift fork pads if they were removed, and install the range shift sleeve in the range shift fo range fork. All right, so we've got our original, this whole assembly here, which was uh, front case half two, three, four, five, six, eight, 11, 12, and 13. And we are going to replace these pads. And the replacement pads, the center is going to be a discontinued part from GM 1407291. That'll be the center pad. You always want to kind of compare these with your originals to be sure. So that guy will fit right in there. There's a notch on the inside that fits into the notch on the metal and locks it in. And then the two side ones are still available. They'll be replaced with GM 1403796. We need two of these. You should always replace these. This is a wear item. Same thing here where you've got the little, little piece that fits in there. Whoops. And we're just going to kind of compare with our old ones. So it's exactly the same. Okay. And then they want us to take this assembly with those new pads and reinstall it into front case half part seven, which is our original that we've cleaned up and restored. Like that. And now they want us to put that whole piece, assemble, 
into the planetary that we just installed. So align the range shift sleeve on the planetary carrier. Align the roller on the range fork in the control actuator lever slot. That's this guy right here. There's a little roller here. Should be spinning freely if you've cleaned up everything properly. And install the range shift fork. All right, so put this guy up like this. And so this roller here, this little roller here is going to fit into and follow this groove on the lever. That's his home. So we're going to move the lever around so that we can get that to fit in there. And at the same time, we get the teeth to fit in up here. Might take you a little bit just to get everything to line up just right. It's a very close tolerance. There we go, finally. All right, so we got all that in, and now to secure it, we need to insert the shift fork shaft. So here's our original, front case half part 14. All cleaned up. All right, now we got that in position. Now we're going to install the clutch lever and the two clutch lever pivot pins. So let's get those parts. All right, let's make sure our shaft is in all the way. Now we have our cleaned and restored fork, front case half part 42. All right, so all cleaned up. No, and there's a roller on this that should be rolling freely. And this guy rolls on top of the lever. And then if you recall from the disassembly video, our pivot pins were shot, so we definitely had to replace them. That's GM part 890-59638. It's the whole assembly, including the O-rings. All right, and then tells us that we should install uh, new o-ring seals but we have to replace the bolts so they came with new o-rings lubricate the o-rings with transfer case fluid so we're going to take some auto track 2 transfer case fluid because this is an auto track the 246 is an auto track not an insta track and we're going to get some fluid out of here and this is you know smurf blood smurf oil whatever you want to refer to it as you cannot use um, Dexron 6 on these. You used to be able to use Dexron 3, and then they replaced it with this. Okay, so we got that guy lubed up. And we got this one lubed up. And they come with a thread sealant pre-installed. So now if we come inside here, we're just going to make sure these pins fit into the fork. There's one. There's two. And I got to get one of them started first. Once you get them started, it'll stay. All right, and these get threaded in with a 12 millimeter Allen head socket. Twelve millimeter Allen head. And you gotta do them evenly. 
Go in on one side a little bit. Go back to the other side. Until you end up getting everything fully seated. Make sure you've got these aluminum washers on here too that you see. The biggest problems with these transfer cases is they have a mag, you know, they're made of magnesium. They make contact with steel. They'll get corrosion from dissimilar metals. Make it very hard to get the pieces apart. You can see that the top of the Allen head has got like, you know, a kind of plastic coating all over it to make the steel be somewhat protected. So we got these guys snugged up on both sides. And what we want to do now is we want to kind of see is everything moving okay. So if we actuate everything, so if the encoder motor was to turn on and was to turn this, hopefully I can get this to move with my hand here, right? As it goes up, these pads will engage the clutch and get your front, wheel, front wheels and four wheel drive. That's how this whole assembly works. Then back in two wheel drive, this whole thing would then fall back down. Now she's not fully assembled yet, so she's not under the right pressure to be working the way you'd want. Once we get the rest of the assembly in here, this will be a lot less moving around. Okay, we got this in. Now we need to torque these, I imagine. Yes, um, pivot pins get torqued to 30 foot-pounds. So we're going to go ahead and torque those to 30 foot-pounds and move on. All right, after we get the pivot bolts torqued to 30 foot-pounds, and by golly, do not go over, guys, you'll strip out this magnesium. Now we're going to put in the uh, shift detent plunger assembly. And so that is going to be front case half part 24, front case half part 22, front case half part 21, are the originals all restored, and front case half 23 is the O-ring. We're going to replace the O-ring, and that's going to get replaced with the GM140-71849. And this guy is going to go in right here. So just like the diagram shows, we're going to assemble these components. Spring goes into the plunger, aluminum cap, and then our O-ring, bag in a bag deal again, Henko in Mexico, All right, and I imagine they want us to lube this guy up. Let's see. Uh, lightly, let's see, lightly lubricate a new shift detent plunger O-ring seal. Okay, so. See if we got enough Smurf blood in here to do this lightly. Roll that onto here. Stick this and this in there, and then screw this whole assembly into here. And they want us to, let's see, that's going to be a 23 millimeter. And they want us to take that to 13 foot-pounds. So we'll torque that to 13 foot-pounds, and we'll keep going. All right. Once you get that to 13 foot-pounds, and again, guys, do not over-torque it. It's aluminum going in the magazine. It has to be 13 foot-pounds, no more. All right, so now we're ready to pull our main shaft out. Here's our cleaned and restored main shaft. And what they're telling you here is if you have a new one, or for some reason you remove this little plug at the end, they're telling you, well, actually, only if it's new, they're telling you that that plug that's an oil restrictor has to be plugged into the end of the shaft right here right so we didn't touch this so we don't need to worry about that step we can move on to this step which is to take the rear output shaft excuse me the uh, the bearing 
gets installed into the clutch housing here. So that's ITC 17. So here's our clutch housings all restored, cleaned up. The bearing that came out of there is that double bearing, which was an ITC 18. And the writing on this, we marked, faces the rear. And that's going to get replaced with a GM 12470557 bearing. Which is marked F69343, made in the USA. All right, so once again, we're going to have the writing facing into the rear position. Let's see what they're telling us to once again use the J36370 and the double shoulder side. So very similar to what we did earlier. We'll be using this same tool or the alternatives I gave earlier in the video. Be seating that on the double shoulder part so that it can be recessed the appropriate amount. Let's see what we got after that. After we get that on there, we're going to put the shaft in this housing together and then we'll install the clutch hub. All right, so let's go do all that and then we'll come back. All right, guys, we got the carrier sitting on a block of wood. We're going to put the writing facing the rear, just like our old one. It doesn't say anything in the service manual that it matters but we're going to put it the way we found it. And in this case, that means facing down. And then we're going to put our tool in with the double edge in that position. We're just going to press her in. She goes in quite a ways. In fact, in this case, this is the end of the travel of our press. I'm going to have to actually raise it up one notch to finish this. All right, we've raised our press up one notch. We can now finish the last little bit that this guy needs and get him mated up with the shaft and continue. And you just go down until it bottoms out. And once it bottoms out, you're done. And again, if you're using your own setup, I'll give you the measurement for the depth that this guy goes in. All right, let's continue. All right, guys, the depth of that step the tool puts in here, just for your reference, if you're trying to replicate it yourself, it's about 2.4 millimeters. 2.4 millimeters. Okay, now we take this guy, we put him on there, and then we take our ITC 19, which is the clutch hub, and we install him on top of there. And then they get into building this sub-assembly. I, I put all this detail in the disassembly video, so I'm not going to go over it in detail again here. Just note that there are some differences between preload and non-preload clutch designs. Also, this information about the difference in the friction plates is old. They don't service these eight groove ones anymore. Everything gets serviced with the 20 groove version. So what we're going to do is just go past this. There it is for you. If you didn't watch my disassembly video, we're just going to jump into what we need to do next. All right. So um, if you have a preload clutch, then you're going to install a clutch oil restrictor plate. We do not have one. We're going to be installing this, which is if it's a non-preload clutch, there's a clutch spring. And that is ITC 21 here. All right, guys, we had a little glitch with the camera battery. Going to pick this up again with getting the spring out of the bag. 
And then, like our manual suggests, she's going to get positioned. A little bit of debris in here. Let's get that out of there. Right like that. Now, the next thing in the manual would go through is talking about building up the clutch. But before we're going to do that, we're actually going to skip ahead and put the retaining ring in here first. Because normally what you'd do is you'd run the clutch pack around the outside and then you'd put the retaining ring like that. But I'm just going to go ahead and get it in now because that way I can get my fingers in here and it's going to be just a potentially a little bit easier. So that old ring was uh, internal transfer case part 22. And that translates to a GM ring 125. 47606. So we're going to pop one of these guys on there. And you guys will see in a minute why I'm doing this kind of early. This ring's also a little bit tough to get on to begin with. Okay, we got one more set of teeth to get by down here. You want to look in the back here while you got it open in the front. You're going to just push it down in the back. And then once we get it past those teeth, you can push it into place. And again, just like we've done on the, every time else, we've spin it around and we'll make sure that she looks in place. Now, why do we do that? Well, because we want to be able to set this down while we work on building the clutch. And that'll let us do that. All right, now, continuing back with the manual. This is a non-preload clutch, so we installed that spring. The 246 has a clutch backing plate that looks like this. And here's our original one all cleaned up. And what they're trying to point out to you is that there's an indentation here. There's like a notch. Right, so they show that in the picture. There's a notch on this type. And if you didn't happen to catch that, you would notice the witness marks from the old friction plate that sat on here. This guy's going to go sit right in here, just line up the teeth. And then for the 236, it's a similar part, but the notch is a different shape. So it's got more of a step shoulder, but same thing, faces down. And now you're going to build up the frictions and steels. So what they're going to mention here is that the 236 uses eight friction plates and seven steels, and the 246 uses 10 friction plates and nine steels. What they're telling you here is the assembly is you install a friction and then a clutch, and then you continue to install in alternating order friction, friction, steel, 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 and then you get to the very top. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. However, there's something else they tell you. Um, they tell you make sure the tabs are all aligned and um, there should be a comment in here about um, looping these guys up, usually. It's what I usually do. Make sure I didn't miss something, guys. Hmm. So they're not, um, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, 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 nope. That's right. That's right. This model has to be shimmed. So you do not, do not, do not, do not lube it up. I remember now. Yeah, these guys you can't lube up because you got to put them in dry because it's going to affect the, the shimming and the stack. So remember before in the disassembly video and also earlier here we talked about there were two types of frictions, one that has eight segments and one that has 20. Just remember they're all serviced by the 20 now which is GM 890-59648 and again you put them in dry. So there's our first friction and then our steels are going to be serviced by 12547608.
And so that's all you're going to do. And we got our little visitor here in the video. Let's get rid of him. Just going to keep alternating these guys in until we get them all loaded up. And again, just make sure you're, you're putting these tabs in all the same for all of them. It can sometimes be helpful to have like a magnet to sit all these guys in here. And once we get done with this, we'll be coming up to a good stopping point for this video because we're going to have to put a special tool on here to determine the amount of shim that we need. And we won't know what the amount of that shim is until we get finished with all this. And you're going to have to go pick that part up. So you can end up having a delay and continuing the video anyway. All right, almost done, guys. What I was thinking of is when you do an automatic transmission, you would normally lube up these frictions, but not in these transfer cases. All right. So we got a bunch of empty GM bags here. And we continue back in our manual. So at this point, we've built our clutch pack. We started with a friction and we ended with a friction. Now they would have told you to put that snap ring in at this point. We put it in at this early because we wanted to be able to sit it here on the table. We made sure that all the plates, tabs are aligned. And they're just telling you make sure that um, the, uh, the clutch plate is, is the first thing that you put in. At this point, we're going to start this uh, shimming procedure. So let me get that set up, and we'll come back and do that. All right, guys, before we start the shim procedure, just to kind of pop back here about what we did with this whole thing here, looking at our parts explosion. So after we, um, you know, we took these parts here, so let me make sure I use the correct naming here, right? So after we took the clutch housing, we pressed in the bearing, we popped in part 19, which was the clutch hub, we put our spring in, we put our retaining ring on, we put our backing plate with the notch, and then we loaded up alternating frictions and steels, so the frictions are 24 and the steels are 25 in this. And then the last item, 26, is what's called a clutch shim, right? And so that is the part that has to be sized and adjusted. So when we come over here and we get done with this page, we are at this stage here. And here's our old shim. Now we're not going to reinstall that. We have to size for that. And so to size for that, we have to use this special tool setup. There's just no way around it. You have to have this special tool. And so this is a three-piece tool. It's got a base unit. So we're going to take this out, and we're going to load it into this base unit. And what we want to get underneath here is we want to make sure that the whole assembly is sitting flush on this base unit. And then we're going to take this calibrated weight and we're going to put that on top of the clutch pack. I'm going to sit there just like that. And then there's a tool that sits between the two of them that's another calibrated tool. And that tool sits just like this. All right, so you got to make sure it's all the way flush in the base then right up against the weight. And then what you're looking at is this gap. And on that gap, we want to start taking a feeler gauge and we want to start measuring how much that gap is. And the shims come in specific sizes. If we turn the page, these are the sizes for the shims. So we can start off with just measuring the shim sizes and see if any of these is a good match. So the first one I'm going to try here is uh, I'm try 30 because there's a 32 thousandths shim. And you can combine these. So we need more than 30. 
So all we're going to do, and this is going to be a lot of trial and error, guys. I'm going to be just combining different feeler gauge amounts until I can get zero. So I can completely close this off. All right, that's too much. So that's what I'm going to be doing on each one of these. Until I have, just like, you know, gapping a spark plug, right? We're going to go do that on each of the three pads of this tool, the same procedure. So I'm going to go do that, and then we're going to come back and see how much we got. All right, guys, I finally found the one I'm happy with here, which is 51 thousandths. All right, so if I combine a, a 21 thousandths and a 30 thousandths feeler gauge together, that closes up that gap very nicely, as you can see. And that works exactly for the number two pad. It's just a little bit off for the number three pad, but as we see when we come back to the manual, they, they mention that you can have uh, up to four thousandths deviation here. All right, guys, just reviewing what we did here. Um, we put the base plate of the J44295. Now, they say it's in a base. It doesn't matter just as long as it's stable and level. So with the, the, the uh, machine tabs facing up, we installed the rear output shaft with our built-up clutch assembly um, into this J44295, and then we added the weight on top of the assembled clutch plates, and then we put the gauge block on one of the locating tabs. This is these machined pads that we saw in the triangular shape. And we took a feeler gauge between the gauge block and the top of the weight, as I showed you, and we measured what it takes to close the gap between those two. We took all three pad measurements. The average of the three is what kind of shim that you need. Now they also mentioned that you can select from the clutch pack, excuse me, clutch plate shim package, the correct shim or shims, you can combine these plus or minus uh, 0 0.1 millimeter, which is four thousandths of an inch. Now, I gotta stop and tell you that this pack is no longer available from GM for many, many years. This um, service manual, I mean, excuse me, the service bulletin came out uh, back in 2004, where they broke this pack up, which was kit number 1247421, and they got rid of that, and they broke them all up where each shim is its own part number. Um, probably because, you know, people were, were having a lot of waste there. And so what we're after, and your, your, yours will be different. Everybody's measurement will be different. What we're after is this point, uh, 0 0.051, 51 thousandths one, which is 12547614. So we're going to have to go track that down. Just for grins, let's take a look at our original shim. And let's see what one was in there before we did this rebuild. So this is a one point eight six millimeter and that's a little bit off so let me make sure I'm not grabbing a a burr or something of course you know some of this material has probably been worn off rubbing against the friction plate I'm going to guess just because it's one eight six and you know you can see there's been some wear on this over the years but it's pretty uniformly one eight six or one eight five I'm going to guess this started life and that's, that corner is 192. This probably started life as a uh, 81 thousandths shim, which is the 7617 one. So the point they make in this, though, is after obtaining the desired thickness, do not remove the plates from the clutch housing. Don't disturb it. Don't change it. Because if you take it out, you could end up changing the measurement. It's that sensitive. And this is usually where folks go wrong. They skip this step or they don't do it right. And then the clutch pack does, dies a very early life. So we're trying to get another two plus decades out of it. So that's why we did it by the book. All right, at this point, guys, this is a good point to stop this video because I got to go out and track down this particular shim. If you got comments or questions on part one here, go ahead and leave them below and I'll try to help. If you found this video useful, it saved you some time or you just learned something, please take a, take a moment to hit that like button. I'd really appreciate it. And as always, thanks for watching and stay tuned for part two.